some kind of understanding about a particular field as such. Uh, we had been uh, doing, uh, we have been uh, publishing, we have been writing, we had been uh, conducting seminars, conferences, and so on for the past uh, uh, one decade or so. And uh, right now, in this particular year, we had actually conducted a training program, and this is the uh, second activity that is newly that is being done this year, that is the uh, webinar over here that we have uh, ongoing projects uh, on various aspects of plantation of tea, rubber, coffee, and all. Uh, we're looking at various aspects, including labor issues of labor, issues of farmer producers organizations, if you issues on uh, small tea growers, and so on and so forth. So we have uh, an active research program that is going on. And uh, we have also other aspects uh, relating to training program, workshops, and uh, consultancies and all those things. That are so, uh, friends, now, uh, uh, and um, all those of you are who, who are interested in any ways in plantation, please send us a mail if you have the mail ID with us, or you can get in touch with uh, me or uh, the and uh, through NRPPD website. You can there is an NRPPD website that is given there, and uh, you can get in touch with me or send a mail so that uh, we can put you in the loop regarding what kind of opportunities are available for uh, people to uh, get engaged with the National Research Program on Plantation Development. Thank you, Tony, uh, for agreeing to be here. Uh, now let me pass on the mic to Dr. Abhilash, who will chair the session. Thank you, Abhilash, for agreeing to chair the session. Abhilash? Yeah. Huh. One second. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Tony, and uh, uh, thank you, Professor Vinoj. And uh, this is the sixth uh, webinar series uh, that is conducted by the NRPP, the Research Wing in CDS. So let me come to the uh, point of discussion today. Uh, we all are aware that the community trading in our derivative market is getting new heights these days, especially. Uh, among the among the common people also among the common men also especially regarding this commodity market mcx is quite popular these days uh you know the commodity training has become a a, 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 a way forward for the youngsters doing the trading uh, especially uh, when when the time is time got extended because morning to morning nine o'clock to 12 o'clock this is the motto people are all talking about However, the, however, the value of few significant agricultural commodities have plummeted into very low these days. I mean, since last, after, especially after uh, the COVID. And cardamom is one among them. Uh, being a cash crop, cardamom expected to perform very well in the commodity market. But uh, things have gone into a different direction. Uh, we know that the media has reported we also read in, 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 a, in a scanty literature, it is showing that there are some institutional mechanism uh, the state has, uh, uh, you know, initiated or state has formulated like, you know, WDRA Act and uh, Food uh, Food Service and Safety Standard Authority of India, FASAI Act. These are the basic information only we know, the public domain people know that. What that is that that causes the uh, you know the downfall of the cardamom in the commodity market uh, to uh, but we need to know much more uh, detail what went wrong with this you know with this with the downfall of the uh, of of cardamom and what happened beyond this in our popular knowledge and uh, what are the causes behind this downfall and what lessons we can, uh, you know, we can learn from this downfall of cardamom in, in the commodity derivative market. Just uh, to discuss all these issues, today we have with us uh, Mr. Tony Kurian. Mr. Tony Kurian is a PhD candidate in Development and Economics, sorry, Department, uh, Department of Humanities and Social Science at IIT Mumbai. Uh, he recently submitted his, uh, submitted his thesis titled Social Futures a sociological study into differing performance of three agricultural future market. He was also a Fulbright scholar and a, a disability rights activist. Uh, he became one of the finest um, person who discuss, who can discuss this issue. And he will speak to us today on the topic of crushed futures 
why cardamom future market failed and uh, uh, the the tone Ms. Tony will be speaking to us around 40 minutes. Uh, then we will move to the question answer session. Uh, welcome, Tony, once again. And the floor is yours. We can start now. Um, hi, I, I hope I'm audible. Um, yeah, you are audible. And and the slide is up on the screen. Uh, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let me start by um, uh, you know thanking Professor Vinoj and uh, Professor Abhilash. Um, you know as well as Sandra who kind of coordinated all this stuff, uh, but I have a larger acknowledgement to give uh, to NRPPD. Uh, that is because uh, in my own research, I gained a lot by reading NRPPD research. And um, I was just checking before this talk, you know, how many NRPPD working papers I cited and I realized I cited like six of them. Uh, so um, I, I think this is one of the place, uh, this is, uh, you know, it's, uh, I have my deep gratitude towards NRPPD and uh, uh, the research uh, that's, that's happening there. It has helped me. Um, also, a lot of folks who work at CDS, uh, you know, since 1980s, 90s, um, you know, I did rely on a lot of their work. I mean, really, uh, you know, picked up standing on the shoulders of the giants, as they call it. Um, so, so my, my, um, my gratitude, um, you know, I, I don't think I would have been able to finish my thesis in some sense without, uh, uh, you know, being very well informed by the work and research that NRPPD does. Um, um, so the topic for the day, um, and thank you, Professor Abhilash again here. Um, so, uh, very well, uh, placed contextually, uh, that's because I, I mean, the things what Professor Abhilash highlighted, like that of, you know, uh, the, um, the uh, WDRA and, and, you know, these are the things that we have read in the media, but what beyond that, you know, what, what do we see if you peel that off and, and kind of uh, look at, um, is there anything beyond that that, that we see, uh, what led to the downfall of, uh, of futures market, okay? So this is a part of uh, my PhD, of course, and uh, I, I did do three commodities, so cardamom being one of them. What I'm going to do today is to sort of, uh, uh, not follow the pattern of a linear paper uh, as you would read it in a journal. Rather, I thought, you know, because, you know, I understand it's 3.30 for, you know, kind of uh, nappy time, relaxation time. So I, I, I thought it would be better if I kind of uh, work it as a talk more than, you know, following a linear uh, pattern of a paper. Uh, that's what I will do. Okay. Let me just. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is to ask five questions uh, and 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 uh, do this talk around those five questions. So the first, I um, mean, you know, uh, so basically we are going to follow by answering these questions, and I think these questions are important uh, because I use my my disciplinary background happens to be uh, economic sociology. Um, I will come to that, uh, what it entails, while answering um, uh, the, the sort of uh, one of the questions. Uh, but I wanted to, uh, you know, guide all of you to the fact that we are going to do this by answering these five questions. Um, and I'm going to, not going to spend, uh, because it is NRPPD and, and people are aware about what futures market is, I mean, usually when I give this talk or any talk related to my PhD, I spend a lot of time explaining what futures market is, and thankfully I'm saved from that uh, plight here, so I know we'll do that. Um, okay, so uh, so what I'm going to do uh, is first up and give you the summary of of what happened. Okay, I, I think that's important. Now, uh, as as you would have read in the abstract, uh, you know, cardamom futures market was supposed to perform very well uh, because you know it's a cash crop um, and this reasonable price volatility, there is some international market and so on and so forth. Um, it did not work out. Um, and why so? Um, was the question I was interested in. And uh, my broadly, my answer is that. Okay. Uh, broadly, my answer is that, uh, you know, uh, it primarily happened uh, because uh, there was some kind of uh, a war, one can call it so sociologically, between uh, the local traders and the national uh, national traders or you know, national capitalists, as they would call them, uh, who basically uh, were primary and big investors in the futures market. Uh, they had they were in a confrontation with the traders who were doing cardamom trade for the long time, 
uh, you know, that they also included planters, they also included, uh, you know, uh, small time traders, uh, and, and, and there was, there was a contestation and that contestation played out, uh, on the quality of the commodity. Um, um, so the, the quality of the commodity, which is basically cut down here was the terrain on which, uh, that, that what played out, right. And, and that's why, um, that's why the cardamom futures failed. So that's the broad sort of summary sort of account that I say in my thesis with regard to cardamom. We are going to kind of, uh, we are going to now unravel this and see what, uh, what it entails. Um, that's the, uh, uh, that's, that's the task at hand, right? Okay. That's what we are going to be interested in. Um, so essentially I'm trying to say that, Hey, if cardamom futures fail, that's because there is, there is some sort of class war in the market. And that class war resulted, uh, uh, you know, in in, uh, in in a particular politics that resulted in the failure um, of cardamom futures. Okay, so okay, now this is important. Uh, usually, when people you know study uh, something like this, it's important for us to uh, outline what do we mean uh, by. Uh, by a success. I mean, how do you, how do you define, you know, the futures market succeeded or failed or something like that. Now, if you are coming from a, uh, you know, economics and ethics sort of position, you would say that, you know, but, you know, there should be some normative parameters around which you should define success. Um, or if you are uh, an out and out econometrician, you would say that, no, no, we need, uh, we need to do some, you know, co-integration tests. We need to see how, uh, how the futures market, did it help in risk mitigation? Did it help in price discovery? So on and so forth. And depending on our answers, we could uh, de uh, decide whether the market failed or succeeded, right? Um, but but if you go if you go through the literature on futures market, particularly around this issue, uh, it's it's a simple factor. It says that you know the best proxy for success is liquidity, right? All you have to know is how many contracts are being traded, right? And and different scholars give different answers to this. Some people said you know ten thousand contract in a year. Uh, you know, denote success. Some people said, you know, 1 million contract in a year defines success. Some people said, oh, no, 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 all that is nonsense. You know, it basically commodity specific. So depending on the production of, uh, the volume of the commodity being produced, the number of the liquidity parameter also should change. Um, so, so I picked up, uh, liquidity as a proxy, uh, for success, obviously, um, a, a contract that doesn't get traded, a contract without any liquidity, um, is a failed contract, right? And as a side note, as a side note, let me also tell you, um, let me also tell you that, um, you know, um, 75 percent of futures contracts in the world usually fail okay? by which I mean liquidity dry out and it gets abandoned. Right. And that's true in India. I mean, if you look at NCDX today, uh, many contracts uh, are stopped by government by force. I mean, you know, uh, by virtue of. Uh, it being a government or uh, a large set is, you know, kind of uh, got scuttled, like in the case of cardamom, right? Um, so most agricultural futures contract, uh, you, you don't see liquidity either, uh, either by force or through some sort of natural I mean, market process. Uh, so that's what, uh, that's what usually happens um, around 75 to 80 percent contract. And that's true in India, that's true in many other countries as well. So. Um, okay. Um, so what I'm trying to do is to pick up data, uh, and to, sh to see what happened, what word does cartoon stand, uh, in terms of success. And you should, uh, specifically look at the second, uh, thing, the average, uh, daily contract trade in a year. And you would see that it started decent. I mean, it's not bad, uh, somewhere in 2012, 13, 14, it, it kind of picks up. Um, I mean, it, it's on its peak and then it kind of plateaus there for a while and then it declines and declines. And in 2021, uh, you literally have zero contracts traded. Uh, the other two column three and four are interesting for us to see the, to compare, uh, price volatility. That is just for me to highlight the fact that, uh, this is a commodity with large price volatility. So there are years in which the number of contract might be uh, traded might be low, but you, you would see the, the, the value, you know, would be pretty high. That's on account of. Uh, price uh, thing. So, um, so, so our focus is on the second aspect, which is the average, uh, average daily traded uh, contract. I mean, and you would see that uh, in 2021, it sort of, uh, you know, was zero all over. 
And by end of 2021, uh, MCX wrote this cute little letter to SEBI and said, hey, we are not no more interested in trading this contract, in, in running this contract, um, please, please spare us from this. Uh, and that is how the Cardamom future sort of crashed, as I would call it. Okay. Now that we know that there is empirics to say that the card, the, the data did not, I mean, now we have the data to show that the, the market did not succeed as per our definition of success, uh, uh, as per our, our proxy of, of liquidity for success. Let's now try and see why it happened, right? And the step by step. Um, okay, so the question that interests us, um, uh, albeit an economic one, what you ask, uh, I'm interested in explaining, uh, in, in showing you what's the sort of methodology I use. now. If you are students of economics, and I think most of you, uh, you know, would have some are students of economics or will have some prior idea about what economics is, even if you are not uh, an economic student per se, you would you should understand that the uh, when economics study market. I mean, economics is obsessed with understanding market. I mean, this is what we are told in economics one hundred and one. But when economists usually study market, they sort of assume this, right? And and in fact, uh, my paper, which I kind of um, write, uh, which is forthcoming, I start the paper with a few quotes from Nobel uh, winning economists who say that, hey, we know nothing about market. You know, we kind of assume market. So for example, Ronald Coase admits it, you know, Douglas Notes admits it, and a whole lot of other economists admit that, you know, we know very little about market. You know, we kind of assume, we, treat, we take exchange as synonymous to market, but market is, a whole bunch of other institutions. There's a lot of micro uh, institutional slash micro things working in the market. And usually economics is ignorant of that. Now, off late, off late, there has been a trend in economics. Um, you know, recently, if you look at, you know, uh, the newer branches of economics, you know, economics of market, market microstructure and so on and so forth, do pay some attention to the, um, uh, to the to the aspects of institutions and, and and rules and stuff like that in the market, right? And and this obviously came from uh, picked up uh, from the new institutional economics. So for the but for the large large part, uh, economics did not pay a lot of attention to understanding how uh, how, how how markets uh, function. Okay, uh, that is very important for us to understand. And 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 differing from that. Okay. Differing from that, uh, other disciplines, okay, when I say other disciplines, there is sociology, there is anthropology, but there is also uh, what can be broadly put in under the rubric of uh, uh, heterodox economics. So, you know, you know, you have Marxian economics and some people, some people would also put <laughs> Keynesianism in the heterodox basket. But in any case, uh, some economists and uh, some non-economic social sciences like economics, I mean, like anthropology and sociology, Paid a lot of attention uh, into understanding how market work works. Um, um, so what we do, and I belong to this 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 category of people. We we are interested in understanding how market functions uh, on a daily basis, right? So this would involve a lot of informal and formal institutions. This would this would involve a lot of political things. This would involve a lot of cultural things, um, a lot of norms that goes into this. Um, and and I put all of them together and say that, you know, because if these are, I mean, actually existing markets, um, actually existing market studies. And I said that, you know, so let, let me call it actually existing market studies because uh, there is not, I mean, it's not a, it's not a branch of social science that exists. I just, you know, came up with that term to kind of make things a bit easy for me, but actually existing market studies that constitutes uh, sociology, that constitutes a uh, bit of political economy and, and heterodox economics slash anthropology, all of these guys uh, from different different perspectives what we do is to look at market in in a much more detailed manner look at ma market in a much more micro manner in a much more institutional manner and you would see that happen uh, that happening um uh, uh you know that happening uh, here right um uh, so that's something that um, uh, that I'm, that I'm going to do okay just give me a second Okay. Um, so now I don't. I understand that is not something that frequently happens in economics, uh, but it is somewhat must came when it comes to non-economic social sciences is to broadly uh, outline the epistemological point of view the, that you are employing. And for me, um, 
that is to say two things. One is to say that I'm interested in understanding how how firms uh, how firms understand or how firms manage uncertainty in the market. Now remember, futures market primarily is a tool to mitigate risk or to handle uncertainty, right? But my response to that question is to say, and and there's a lot of uh, this in my thesis. Maybe if anyone is interested in the social theory underlying this argument, we can go to that in the Q and A. But broadly, what I'm saying is that. That's true that that people are interested. People are interested in managing uncertainty. But the problem is that the uncertainty is not felt at an individual level. Now, if you look at both economics and even uh, you know what is called as new economic sociology and so on and so forth, we are told that uncertainty um, is experienced at an individual level in the market, right? Whether it be firms, whether it be consumer, you are going to experience uncertainty at an individual level. Subsequently, the, epistem the epistemological stance they adopt. Is, uh, is is methodological individualism is micro foundationalism, right? And my response to that is to say no. Uncertainty is partly individual or partly group. That means that my epistemological position is going is is not going to be methodological individualist. It definitely will have some non methodological individualist elements. And I use class as a as a category to un, uh, to explain how uh, firms in the market uh, experience uncertainty. And I use non-economic power as a means to explain how firms in the market handle uncertainty. Now, this is important that I'm arguing that although uncertainty happens in the economic realm, right, the way in which firms manage that uncertainty is going to be uh, happening in the non-economic realm partly, and that non-economic realm is basically non-economic power. Right? We would come to this, um, how this works. In a, Okay, so now that we are in a position, I outlined the rationale for uh, saying, you know, why uh, the epistemological standpoint I use. Um, the key question that interests us here, us here is to ask that who are the key actors in the market. Now, if it is class, if class has uh, uh, an explanatory power uh, in, explain, in, in, in telling us the failure of cardinal futures, what who are the classes? What are the classes uh, which are which are at war with each other? In, in, you know, typically, right? And I say that there are two primary classes which we are interested in. I call them uh, the the regional capitalist uh, fancy term I use, uh, picking up from social, uh, you know, uh, people like Barbara Harris White and Bala Gopal and so on and so forth, is to call them uh, rural commercial capitalists. The other class uh, that is at work here. Um, is the, uh, is the is the is the national capitalist uh, you know uh, and 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 they are the guys who are primarily interested not in the commodity not in the underlying commodity they are only interested in the price movement now remember this difference is very important the rural commercial capitalists unlike the um, unlike the uh, national capitalist is interested not only uh, in in uh, in in the uh, in the price movement, but they are also interested in the underlying commodity. We say we the national capitalists. These are the guys who who are in Mumbai, in Delhi. Uh, you know the, the, these are the places. You know if you go to the field and if you talk to uh, cardamom traders, they will say that oh those are traders from North India. And you know in Kerala, like everything beyond Hyderabad is North India, right? Uh, <laughs> so uh, but but this is what they mean uh, when they say this these North Indian traders. I mean they essentially. Say that um, you know those people they are interested uh, in, in in the in the uh, you know in the uh, uh, price movement and not essentially in the uh, underlying commodity because they are invested in many many commodities while we are only interested in cardamom and perhaps one more commodity. So for us, commodity matters and for them the movement of price matters more. Now, if you look at the cardamom traders uh, closely, uh, you would see that they have all the characters of uh, what is called as the rural commercial capitalists, right? One, to start with, they are dominant, right? Uh, they use political. So, uh, I mean, I can come to this in the Q&A if it, if it comes to, I mean, if anyone has any queries, but here is, the, here is a very, very, very short, uh, uh, you know, part of the story, uh, version of the story, right? This is what happens. Uh, sometime in 1950s, post-colonized, uh, post-independent, um, government of Kerala uh, was interested in, uh, actually the Travancore government and then the government of Kerala was interested in increasing the population of Malayalis in the Karnam uh, Hill Reserve, CHR region. That is because, uh, you know, they were worried that if 
there is no enough Malayali population in the state might go to Tamil Nadu. Uh, among many, many communities that migrated, the maximum advantage in this was picked up by the Syrian Christian community. Um, and after 1965, uh, you know, there's a form formation of Kerala Congress. And I tried to articulate in my thesis uh, that Kerala Congress represents uh, the Syrian Christian attempt to politically dominate the Cardamom Hill Reserve and the and adjacent areas. And you would see that uh, the reflection of this political development in the Cardamom market. Okay. So what is the what is the reflection of uh, uh, of a political entity like that of Kerala Congress, uh, largely formed by Syrian Christians in the Cardamom market? This is what happens. Okay. Now, for historical reasons, for historical reasons, Cardamom market was dominated by Tamil traders. When I say Tamil traders, these are mostly Thevar caste. I mean, they are also upper caste. Um, what happens is that after the formulation of Kerala Congress, uh, Malayali Syrian Christian traders, we will call the Malayali traders, not to, you know, just for sake of parsimony, Malayali traders starts to get a foothold in the Cardamom market. You know, they start as small time traders um, and slowly they use their political clout to start cardamom uh, companies. What is very interesting is that they don't, they don't compete out and out with the Tamil capital. They understand that the Tamil capital is rather strong and they need a lot of expertise of Tamil traders in running the cardamom show. Um, so you need to compete, but you also need to collaborate with them. So if you look at, uh, so then what happens is that there are companies after companies, uh, uh, cardamom trading companies, which are formed, uh, in which Malayali and Tamil uh, uh, individuals uh, are, you know, come together on the directory board. Now, if you go to the, any of these company websites, you will see that the proportion is always you know, almost 60, 40 or 50, 50, something in these range. Of course, there is some here and there, depending on the company you, you, you are trying to figure out. But largely, uh, largely the story is that the Malayali traders uh, get a 40 to 50 percent uh, stake in the cardamom market, right? And this is reflected not only uh, in the, in the company uh, or cardamom trading companies, but you also see, uh, you also look at the volume of cardamom traded both at uh, Bodin Aikinur uh, and Puttadi, and you would see that the proportion holds true. So somewhere uh, after 1990s, you would see a lot of companies in cardamom uh, trade uh, is coming up uh, and, and they are uh, equally or more or less equally owned by the Malayali and Tamil traders. And one more side note to this, uh, is that a lot of cardamom traders also have politicians in their director board and no prices for guessing where these politicians come from. They come from Kerala. They come from largely from Kerala Congress uh, and what is called, uh, you know, yeah, basically the Kerala Congress. Also understand one specific feature of Kerala Congress that it is one political party that has been constantly in power since its formation, right? It's only one term uh, where Kerala Congress has been not a part of the ruling alliance, but otherwise they are one or other of their faction uh, has managed to be in the ruling alliance throughout uh, in the you know for the last um, 60 years 60 odd years right um, uh, yeah which means that this this section of cardamom traders uh, the Syrian Christian cardamom traders always had uh, always had their people in the government and that's that's obvious when you look at the when you look at the rules when you look at the uh, you know how the cardamom leasing rules when you look at the rules, uh, when you look at uh, how Spices board itself uh, changed its character, you would see that more and more uh, uh, Malayali traders getting becoming a part of it. And you can only explain that change if you look at how how how, how the Kerala Congress has been operated. You look at the portfolios which Kerala Congress gets. These are very important portfolios when you look at it from a perspective of a cardamom, uh, cardamom as, a, as, a, as a lively. Okay. Okay. Now we are thankfully uh, at a position to uh, uh, start asking the most empirical question, which I which I think is uh, you know many of you are interested in uh, understanding or rather listening to. Uh, so so before going uh, to the to the key key and the crux of empirical questions, um, I would like you to uh, understand the, the specific empirical framework I use, and that framework is what I call qua politics, and that is a combination of quality and politics. Okay. Now, if you look at explanations uh, about uh, about the the failure of cardamom futures, uh, some people say that you know uh, you know you know if the cardamom if the market has a tendency for monopoly, uh, you know if it's a narrow commodity by which they mean if it's a commodity produced in very little area, it's naturally going to fail. Okay, uh, the sociological explanation um, about quality that's the other side of the argument so that is the market structure uh, version so it's a simple uh, explanation that many people hold 
Um, quality in sociology is conceptualized not as a mat as, as an information as you see in economics. You know, it's not like you know, uh, it's not the lemon car sort of a problem. You know, it's, it's, uh, in in sociological literature, quality is seen as a, 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 an avenue through which people uh, uh, people register their protests in the market. Okay, that that is to say that if you go to any market and there has been work on soybean markets in, in, in Madhya Pradesh, there has been uh, work, uh, work about wheat markets in, in Punjab and, and Madhya Pradesh as well. You look at, and there has been a lot of works uh, from African and Latin American context, you would see that people are interested in bargaining uh, uh, and using the nitty gritties of quality uh, as, a, as, as, as a mode of bargaining. Those quality, uh, the small uh, ambiguities, right? The small ambiguities in the quality is what people are really trying to take advantage to get price to their uh, they like it. I mean, or you know, it is through negotiating the ambiguities in the small aspects of quality uh, that that people register their protests. Now, what I discovered, what I realized in the cardamom market is that it's a combination of two things, right? One is that you have a particular structure of uh, of cardamom market, right, and the other aspect is the particular nature of cardamom, right? These two things come together and they create a particular uh, equilibrium sort of thing, right? Uh, and, and depending on that equilibrium, you the market would be successful or not. I remember our definition of success is just the liquidity, right? Uh, now I could do that in my thesis because I could, I was doing a comparison. So I also had the case of pepper, uh, again, a, a commodity somewhat similar to cardamom in many aspects but was successful uh, successful uh, in the futures market at Ipsta for a very long time. And then sort of uh, it went to the national exchange and we all know this, that story. So there was some sort of comparison. So basically my, my, my broad framework is to say that, hey, there, is, there are two things that are important uh, for a market to be successful. One is the, is, the, is the nature of commodity. The other is the structure of market. And these two things interact with each other, not naturally through political means and Individuals in the market are able to manipulate, uh, are able to sort of not manipulate, are able to play on this. Uh, bo you both cardamom, uh, both quality aspect as well as the market structure, and create conditions in which markets can thrive, or markets can crash, as what happened in the cardamom. So I call it co-politics, and that is the particular framework uh, in which I. Um, Okay, so then the question that interests us is, so what is, okay, so what is the nature of cardamom as a commodity? Now, um, now cardamom is an interesting commodity for two reasons. One, there are many quality grades for cardamom. Okay, the, 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 the arm atmi, the common man, we would not understand that there are too many quality variants in cardamom. That is one thing. The second aspect of cardamom is that uh, it's also commodity. It's like it's very quality sensitive commodity. I mean, um, I mean, from the point of view of traders, if you if you put a cardamom in a warehouse today and take it out after ninety days, from the point of view of traders, the quality parameters change, right? We as final consumers of cardamom wouldn't understand this, um, but the quality parameters change. Okay, uh, now that is very important for us to understand. Um, what is also to be understood is that the price you receive is highly dependent on the quality aspects of cardamom. Okay, because um, um, you know a, 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 the price difference between a six mm and a seven mm cardamom uh, can be uh, rather you know large, right? Uh, depending on the present price point. But in any case, there is definitely some sort of difference, some real difference between uh, a, a, a two qualities of cardamom. The, the last aspect, one more aspect uh, with related to cardamom, the nature of uh, cardamom as a commodity uh, is also the fact that uh, depending on when you harvest it and, and how you are harvest it, how you do the post harvesting processes, uh, the price you receive uh, is highly dependent on all these. Uh, you know, I, I can, I'm not going to all the details of it because, you know, it's, it's sort of, sort of slightly uh, on the drier part, you know, but remember that uh, some kind, some methods of post harvesting uh, can yield you, uh, two, 2000 capsules can yield you, you know, one kilogram. And if you adopt some other methods, you will need 5000 capsule to make one kilogram. That's a huge difference when it comes to uh, the final price received, right? 
So, uh, so cardamom is, is, a, is a quality sensitive commodity. It's a commodity with multiple qualities, and it's a it's a commodity that is uh, the of which the quality is highly dependent uh, on the post harvesting uh, methods we use. Okay, um, that is very important in ex um, in explaining um, you know how cardamom is made. Okay, um, now uh, Tony, uh, can you? Uh, you have uh, 15 more minutes, okay? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I will, I will, I am, that's what I'm trying to sort of, yeah, yeah, picture the time. Okay, so uh, I'll try and rush a little bit here. Um, okay, now this is important for us. So if you look at uh, literature about futures market, and if you look at literature and economics, you would uh, large, the, the, the broad message, the broad message you get is that, um, Futures contract is a rational outcome of market. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a rational thing. But if you look at futures contract closely, you would understand that it's it's a it's an outcome of intense political battle. Okay, so let me explain what futures contract is in a, in, a, in ten seconds. Basically, futures contract contains everything associated with the commodity, right? From the quality of commodity to the place of delivery to everything that you can imagine, right? Uh, now. While I was studying the cardamom market, I observed that there were multiple iterations, multiple versions of futures contract, which was put out by the exchange, right? Why would that happen, right? And there is a process through which uh, exchange designs the futures contract. Um, due to laxity of time, I wouldn't go to that. But what you, what we have to, the larger takeaway here is that the futures contract is, uh, is, is, is highly political, politically contested uh, out, you know, thing. Um, uh, as an example, I cite uh, <laughs> I cite a particular version of contract that MCX came out sometime in 2019. Uh, I remember rightly, 2019 or 2018, which in which they said that you know any cardamom between 6.5 and 7.5 mm would work, um, and that's because um, there was this practice in the in the spot market in which traders traded in what they secretly called as formula grade contract. Um, and once you do that, uh, you can uh, ungrade it. You can, you know, sorry, you can grade it, and you can sell a particular quality of 6.5 or 7.5 uh, in the downstream market. And remember what I said in the previous slide that uh, the price difference between 6.5 and 7.5 can be huge. Okay. Um, uh, so you look at different different contracts of cardamom at different points of time, and you see that the that the, the the specifications keeps changing and you see that the specifications keeps changing because there is push and pull between the spot market traders and the uh, national capitalists between the rural commercial capitalists and the national capitalists and it is the uh, the each specification that you see in the futures contract is an outcome uh, of, of, of these push and pull factors so when when people said that you know we are not interested in <coughs> in, in depositing our cardamom in the futures contract one of the reasons they said was that you know because they accept only one particular grade like seven mm but i make most of my money by 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 getting ungraded lots in the auction market and i kind of grade them and i make money from by selling different grades of cardamom in the different market now i'm not interested only in the seven mm grade market right um uh, so so this kind of uh this kind of uh push and pull is very evident if you look at the uh if you if you talk to the individuals right um Okay, uh, now this is very important to understand, you know, how does market making work uh, uh, in the cardamom market? Now, the moment I say market making, I, I'm implying that market is not a natural thing, you know, just because some people want to sell something and some people want to buy something or, or just because there's a tendency to barter, market doesn't arise there, right? Market is made, right? Uh, so, so, so how, how does market get made in the, in the cardamom market? Now, there, uh, there are two or three uh, kinds of market within the cardamom market. Okay, uh, let's not go to all of that details. The broad market, the large market in cardamom, we are interested in is the auction spot uh, spot market, and that is uh, that happens through auctioning. Okay. Um, now you would believe, you would think that if you are a believer in ball rush in uh, auctioneer, you would say that you only need one auctioneer. Uh, in the market because all that the auctioneer has to do is to auction. I mean, why would you need more than one? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thankless job. You know, it's like uh, you have to stand and you have to shout and that's how, that's how Walrus, you know, that's what Walrus told us. You know. 
Um, but if you go to the Cardamom market, you would see that there are uh, there are there are twelve auctioneers, right? Uh, so each auctioneer gets uh, half a day uh, and six days in a week. In a week makes it twelve auctioneers. Uh, why why would there be twelve auctioneers for a, for a commodity, right? This was the first thing that struck me when I went to the Cardamom market. Like, why should there be more than one auctioneer? If the job is only to auction, why should there be more than one auctioneer? The simple answer to that, the non-sociological answer to that, is that there is a lot of money to be made at the auction in the form of commission and so on and so forth. But the complex answer to that is that, listen, um, there is something very interesting, and this is something I picked up from a work of Professor KJ Joseph, who was at NRPPD, uh, is to say that there is a price differential in the card the market, depending on when the, the, the timing of the placement of your lot. So suppose the auction is between 10 o'clock and 1 o'clock. It's widely believed that if your lot is placed somewhere in the middle between 11 and 12 p.m., uh, 11 a.m. and 12 p.m., it's highly likely that you get a better price. Okay. Um, now this is a perception, and yeah, I did check for the for the for the validity of this perception. Yes, there is indeed a price difference. Uh, the the middle placed option, uh, middle placed lots get better option. And when you ask the traders, you said that you know. For the first one hour, we are trying to gauge the sense of the market. And the next one hour, we all heartedly trade. And by 12 o'clock, we are kind of done with our demand, you know. And then what do you do if you are a cardamom trader? You want to start your own auction company so that you can place the lot you own in the middle so that you get a better price. Okay. Um, now, of course, there is Spices Board, which is a mas master market maker. And um, again, due to laxity of time, one wouldn't go there, but you can. Uh, I do cite multiple court cases to show that the act of awarding license itself uh, is again a politically contested uh, thing uh, or legally contested thing. Rather, uh, uh, you know, many parties believe that they are unfairly not granted license despite uh, you know have, having fulfilled all the requirements. And, and Spices Board has its own arguments to say that you know we were fair. We are not interested in the merit of the argument, but the the larger sociological point we are trying to make is that. Uh, that the 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 auctioneer uh, licenses are also legally contested, and auctioneer licenses gives you a lot of money. Uh, in fact, many many cardamom companies make more money through auction process than trading uh, cardamom itself, and that's why you see a proliferation of uh, of cardamom company. Okay, so uh, now this is uh, you know you can somewhat uh, somewhat skip this part, but. Um, what I want to uh, say here is the fact that now, um, see, there is a lot of uh, internal, you know, the cardamom community is a very tightly knit community. Okay, uh, and if you understand uh, that community, you would understand that pillars of internal credit. For example, uh, the law says that uh, within. 21 days, uh, I think now it's revised to 10 days, I suppose. Uh, when I was doing my field work, it was 21 days. Uh, 21 days after the auction, the, the planter is supposed to get uh, the price, right? But most planters are not in a position to wait for 21 days. So what the auction company would do is to give them the money, they, uh, you know, give them the price of the card, the, you know, which they sold, um, but charge some sort of interest for that, okay? Um, uh, now, um, I don't have a lot of time. So basically what happens, what resulted in the real crash of futures market is the fact that many of the privileges that the cardamom traders enjoyed in the spot market, one, uh, the, the ability to trade in multiple qualities at the same time, two, to make money from auctions, uh, to get your lots at the right moment. Uh, a whole lot of these privileges were not available in the futures market. Added to this, and this is something that I have not put on the slide, but added to this is also the associated costs of testing uh, in the labs, which are in Cochin. Uh, these are the things which we have read in the media, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. But essentially, the broad political economy lesson is to say that the the while the political control of spot market was vested with the uh, the, the local cardamom traders, the political control of the futures market was in the hands of what we call as the national capitalists, right? And that's because it's a devitalized uh, sort of uh, thing, right? And why the cardamom traders were not interested in continuing with the futures market is that they really, they realized 
that they they that they if if they ought to make money in this if they ought to make money in this they need to have some political control of that market and they realize that their market which is the cardamom market the cardamom spot market which is their terrain offers them that political control and that sort of political control uh, is not uh, available in the futures market uh, and that kind of really uh, resulted in the in the manipulating uh, or not manipulating really uh, resulted in them sort of playing with the quality of cardamom uh, you know and creating conditions in which the futures market cannot uh, thrive so if you look, talk to the traders they will say that you know i looked at the futures price i looked at the price signals but i don't invest in that you know um, so they were they particularly created conditions in which there would not be enough liquidity uh, so this is something that um, you know um, i would say like so what's the lesson i mean there are kind of empirical lessons uh, uh, you know, but mostly let, let me confine here uh, to the uh, uh, to other kind of uh, things which I'm interested to say is to say that uh, if you are interested in understanding the market, uh, you have to uh, you know you have to dirty your hand. Uh, you 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 have to understand that market is a complex uh, uh, complex machine, right? It's a machine, uh, but it's a complex machine. It's not a machine that works according to your rational rules. It's not a machine that is depoliticized. It's not a machine that can be depoliticized. Uh, it's a it's a machine in which uh, a lot of non-economic stuff uh, work. Uh, and broadly, the message um, uh, when it comes to the, the the theoretical aspects, the broadly the message of my work is to say that if you want to understand uh, you know how market functions, uh, the answers uh, a lot of your answer is in how the non-economic aspects in a market uh, is lined up. A lot of your answers is in how historically a market has been evolved, um, and of course, uh, some part of your answer is also uh, in the in the specific economics uh, of the market. Um, and I say that I, uh, you know, it's some it's a term I pick up from uh, elsewhere. I call it for talking. This is so that when you do forecasting, uh, rather than relying on uh, uh, you know just only on the models, you perhaps will have to do a lot more talking, uh, and 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 you have to. You know, gradually shift from forecasting to for talking is what I call it. Uh, empirically, my um, empirically my, uh, my 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 lesson, and this is not something I've uh, put out in the uh, in, in in my thesis, but uh, I would like to see what what people think about it. Uh, is to say that revive the regional futures market. Uh, that's not something I've put out, um, and that's because once you do that, you are because I employ a political economy framework. Once I say that you have to have regional futures market. You are taking a specific class position, uh, which I would, which I would. This is from, um, but 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 uh, because it's a crowd uh, that has a lot of ideas about uh, you know plantation and stuff like that. Uh, what I what I think is that if you want uh, a futures market in spices and all of other commodities, uh, you know you have to have that in the regional futures market because uh, none of these commodities uh, manage to do well in the national exchanges. So perhaps uh, doing in, in 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 bringing it to regional futures market. But also making the regional uh, exchanges demutualized in the form of national exchanges, um, maybe is the way ahead. And that's not something I put uh, out in my thesis, but that's something that I am trying to articulate uh, in rather. Um, yeah, I think I think that's it. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I hope I was able to communicate. Um, I look forward to your questions and comments and all of that. And this is a great. Stage for me to get all of that because it's the time when you are uh, transitioning from chapters to journal articles and you know, that stage. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tony, uh, for the comprehensive uh, analysis of the subject. How what happened to Cardam? We know that you know uh, it's a very a large topic. Can be can be you know uh, you know uh, stretched into one one hour or forty five minute. And I will be opening the uh, floor for the discussion now. Uh, you can ask uh, questions and comments. Yeah, people can ask questions and comments. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Ablash, I would like yeah. to raise some some please. please. Go ahead. Yeah. So Tony, this is Vinod here. So yeah. Yeah. 
so uh, firstly very interesting topic interesting uh, not because uh, it is uh, mainly because it is actually uh, going against the grain of many things that we learn as an economist so that makes it it's all the more interesting to kind of get into this thing. so uh, thanks for the presentation now uh, it's for me actually uh, while largely the, the story about market uh, Kind of is complex. The the uh, the uh, the the political economy story that with regard to how politics came about into controlling the uh, local market, from the, the local cardamom market by uh, by using quality as a as a as a way of kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, making it uh, fussy for the uh, futures market. That part is not very clear. To now, why I'm saying it is not clear. I mean, the the the, the logic of market still stands there. The logic of uh, what we call a uh, uh, rationalization in terms of that you need to have certain amount of product uh, uh, control over the product, and therefore you will get better prices, and that is what uh, leads this uh, uh, what we call the the local capitalist, what we call as the local capitalist, to kind of act in particular manners. Which contradicts the, uh, the the goals of the future market. That is what is happening. That's what I understand. Now, is it? Uh, now, um, would you say that this is? Uh, uh, while this probably is the story, would you call that this is not under the uh, uh, logic of economics that is uh, propounded now, or is it? Uh, uh, Beyond the idea of rational rationalization that is done in economics, that is one aspect that I was interested to know more about. And uh, yeah, so let, let, let's start discussing on this thing. If you have, uh, I can wait for others to also ask questions. But if you can give a response to this, it'll be interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, 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 I hope I'm still audible. Um, yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Vinod, actually. Um, no, I mean, so, uh, the, the, so it depends on how you define uh, rationality, right? If you think that um, by rationality, you mean what we all learn uh, in, in, in economics 101, um, you know, we are all maximizing, you know, individuals. Um, the question that interested me, the question that really um, got me uh, to think about rationality and all is that, you know, um, why are these local traders, you know, uh, not interested in uh, getting, uh, investing in, in futures market if they can get price signals from it or if they can actually mitigate the risk from it and so on and so forth. Um, and I realized that uh, it's, 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 it's not, it doesn't come, you're right, that it doesn't completely break away with uh, what's called as, uh, what we learn as the, the, the rational action in the sense that they realize that the money is made in 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 in, in making the quality things a little fussier, right? Playing around the quality aspects, right? But the way they articulate that rationality is not only through economic means. So the, it's still rational, but it is it's 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 made uh, you know explicated through political means. So it's somewhat uh, somewhat politically uh, rational. Um, uh, it's right that it's not it doesn't completely break with uh, what uh, you know what you learn in you know the economic rationality thing and i think it's uh, it would be uh, uh, it would be extremely uh, you know propitious to argue that uh, there is no place for rationality in the market uh, contrary to that there is a place for rationality but that rationality is a, is embedded uh, uh, in in the socio political aspects and that's what uh, that's what i'm trying to say and 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 in the case of cardamom, uh, uh, quality is one aspect in which that that rationality is in. But also it's it's somewhat uh, uh, it's something that one can be called as an embedded form of rationality, uh, and not your uh, not your uh, you know you know thin uh, sort of rationality that many people um, like to think about. Uh, but you are absolutely right that it, it doesn't completely break with rationality, and I don't I didn't see that in the market as well. I think the rationality was sort of embedded in, in many socio-political aspects, so yeah. Uh, before moving to the people, others, uh, let me have a comment. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, you said that, you know, um, the cardamom, uh, sorry, uh, 
Pepper played a played relatively well um, come in comparison with cardamom. We know that you know pepper cultivation is largely a decentralized one, and mm. a lot of uh, you know individuals are involved. But you know yes. grading is also part of pepper uh, because in you know, a garbled and ungarbled, yeah. there there are gradings. So if you could draw some parallels between uh, pe- pe- pepper and cardamom, it would be. I mean, some analogies, yes. you know, then it would be yeah. very, yeah. Uh, very good. Then that's that's an important issue between the two. Can you explain a little more about that? Because of the time constraint, you might not have gone. Yeah, I mean, I, it's a different. So, yeah. so uh, you know, one can also do one hour or so presentation on paper, but but uh, you're absolutely right. So one of the one of the major difference uh, between cardamom and pepper is the fact that it's, it's cultivated, uh, uh, you know, in a decentralized manner. Uh, that is a, there's a biggest difference uh, between the cardamom and pepper when it comes to that. Uh, the other, uh, the other um, important aspect when it comes to pepper is that the spot market, um, again, uh, although the, so there are two, two sets of spot market for pepper, you know, in some sense, one can, one can say that, you know, one spot market is, one half of the spot market is decentralized uh, because it happens uh, to places where it is cultivated. Uh, but the other half of the spot market happened in Kochi, you know, that is where Ipsta was. Um, so what happened in the case of Pepper uh, was that uh, the traders and w- another sociologically interesting aspects is that if it was the Tamil traders uh, who were dominant in the cardamom uh, market, uh, you know, um, in the Pepper market, you know, it was the other kind of non money It's a lot of Gujarati merchants, uh, you know, for that matter, were, trade, uh, were the dominant one. And if you, I mean, uh, just as a, as a trivia, there is that, you know, the, the you know, Mariwala got the name Mariwala because they used to trade uh, Mari in the district. Um, and they were actually one of the three, uh, I mean, the, 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 the patriarch of Mariwala family actually is one of the three, three founders of uh, Ipsta, uh, you know. Um, so yeah, so so coming back uh, to the question, uh, so that that uh, definitely was the case. But what is what used to happen is that uh, Instar managed to run its own uh, futures market uh, for uh, about 50, 50, 55 years, you know, um, um, with with reasonable liquidity. It's not that it was it had a lot of liquidity, but that futures market was highly uh, controlled by a few traders, and you can see that. I mean, I have tried to make a network analysis. Uh, to understand who is related to whom uh, in the director board, and you will see a very thickly made network, uh, you know, in that. Um, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, Cardamom um, never had got the opportunity to run a futures market like that, never had the opportunity to, because Cardamom market, uh, you, you know, the post independent Cardamom market was, was a market that was still politically uh, kind of fragmented between these two, uh, Malayali and the Tamil traders. On the other hand, Pepper market was sites more or less politically consolidated by that uh, by 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 1950s, 60s. You know the the Gujarati traders were the dominant, and the Malayali traders kind of worked side by side with them. Uh, so it was politically sort of settled market uh, in that sense. Um, uh, the other aspects of quality and stuff like that remains, and not only with garbled and ungarbled, there are multiple qualities within. Uh, you know, this, there is uh, MG1, 2, and so on and so forth. Uh, the number of quality of paper is slightly smaller uh, than, than that of cardamom. Um, but also the fact that, um, also the uh, fact is that the role of international market uh, in paper is uh, apparently more important than uh, for cardamom, what is at present, uh, is what I was told. Um, uh, so yes, there are similarities in terms of uh, nature of commodity, but there are definitely uh, key differences when it comes to uh, the, the the political economy of the market, and that was uh, that was because there was uh, a body like that of Ipsta that worked. That, that's the that's the story in in, in, in a just uh, natural sort of. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, can I ask? Uh, this yeah, is please, Bina. Please, please, Professor Bina. Yeah. Uh, this is Bina. Uh, I just wanted to find out. Um, uh, Tony has, uh, you know, has given the suggestion that we uh, we should try to, uh, you know, uh, build a better market or democratically built built markets. So when you talk about this market, and then especially in the context of uh, future market, uh, so I assume that you are talking about this future market. So yeah. do, do you do you really believe? in this future market whether have you done any analysis on the 
uh, on the uh, price with a future market, price without a future market. How it has, uh, you know, it, can you show any kind of uh, fluctuation, you know, that uh, um, graph or something about what has happened to this cardamom uh, by introducing this future market trading? And that, that will give you, you know, because this uh, stock market, you know, many people do not really believe the magic of the stock market. And uh, it's, it did not really materialize also, materialized also, because you, the whole institutional finance, you know, moving from the banking to the stock market, uh, we, we do not really find, uh, you know, majority of the firms able to mobilize resources from the the capital market to fund their finance. So, uh, so in that context, bringing the whole commodity trading, it's not really, no, it's not a very success story. So, what is your view and what is your empirical findings? We all believe in this uh, for talking. No, not we means many, <laughs> many, many people would uh, believe uh, for for talking, not for uh, no for uh, forecasting. So, um, so what do you know? Do you have anything more in more lights on this? Uh, okay, okay, interesting question. Uh, so, um, so I, I think one way to look at it uh, is to say that what happened to the price movement in spot market before and after the introduction of futures now, right? This is what this is one way to think about this question. Now, unfortunately for Cardamom, uh, this is pretty unfortunate, and this uh, even one of the NRPPD working papers uh, this is highlighted that. Uh, the uh, spices board apparently missed a uh, couple of years of data. Uh, I think from 2013 to 15 or 14 to 16, something like that. So I tried to do that analysis to see what is happening uh, to the price, you know, post introduction of futures market, and is it different uh, from uh, you know before uh, the futures market was introduced before 2007 times, right? Uh, the so from whatever I could analyze, and I, I don't have. A, Put that here, but uh, whatever I could see, and this is also from a lot of conversations, and this is true for uh, so this happened in Pepper definitely. Uh, this happened in Pepper definitely, which is a case uh, is that uh, post introduction of futures market, apparently, um, in the case of Pepper, the the price movement uh, between this underlying commodity that is Pepper and the futures uh, uh, were extremely on two different directions, or you know, the the, the Pepper futures showed extreme volatility uh, compared to the spot market, right? And this, uh, many people say, is one of the reasons why uh, Pepper's futures had the, you know, made the fate it uh, met. Uh, but, um, but, but, but uh, one is inclined to uh, believe that the futures market did uh, create a lot more price volatility uh, within it. Uh, which uh, uh, which kind of created uh, a lot of discomfort in the spot market as well, right? Like, but like I said, I, I could not do a continuous analysis because of this data issue. Uh, uh, when I say um, markets should be democratically built and so on and so forth, like I said, I've I've not um, I've not made a made an extreme case for that, and that's because. Uh, but the broad idea there, and uh, you know, is to say that uh, what if what if the futures market were designed by the regional capitalists. Uh, would that be a democratically designed market? Would that be a market that is democratically developed? Um, I, I'm not sure how it would turn out. I mean, it again depends on what you define, what, you know, as what, what it means to be democratic, so on and so forth. But the, but the, but the key insight there would be to say that uh, there should be uh, a process through which the market design uh, uh, can be more consultatively made. Uh, there, there is more. There is definitely a case to say that uh, markets should be uh, uh, headquartered. The market should be primarily based uh, in places which uh, are closer to the centers of production. Um, so, but like I said, uh, I cannot make that argument within my PhD. But I am definitely uh, putting out some evidence to. Uh, uh, show uh, looking at the commodities which were trading in the regional exchanges uh, you know before 2015 16 uh, you know that is when most of them got shut uh, to say that 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 model uh, is something that india have to look at uh, seriously because uh, uh, you know for one thing this model is definitely not working uh, the the model of 
taking all the commodities to the national exchanges is definitely not more working. Uh, perhaps there are some, uh, there is some case uh, for the markets to uh, be happening at the regional level. Uh, is yeah. Any more, yeah, any more questions? I hope uh, there will not be any questions and comments. Uh, uh, Abhilash, if I can come, come one last time. Yeah, please, please. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, to, Tony, uh, the, the cardamom thing, I mean, the, I had visited the auction center once mm -hmm. in Putri. And uh, what my observation was this thing when I had discussed with the people over there, they would say this thing that uh, not the best of cardamom actually comes to the auction center. See, the, uh, it is actually a, uh, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, qualitatively, the inferior ones actually they appear in, in that ones appears there. And it is a, there is another parallel market that goes either to the export Absolutely. market or, or something that's, yes. that goes parallelly that goes. Now, if these markets are all, already differentiated at this level, uh, yeah. at, uh, at the local level, yeah. then, uh, 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 what would it be? When, uh, why do you think that the, it is a futures market that will get affected, while the local market is is also itself kind of differentiated and in a in a way fragmented already? Do you think that there is uh, in, there is any merit with what I'm saying about? No, absolutely, absolutely. I, I think that's that's a brilliant question to be asked. Uh, the 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 answer to that is that so there are three fragments of spot market in Cardamom, okay? And you're absolutely right. One is the auction center, and that's the largest market. Um, second is your uh, large firms, um, you know, taking their own Cardamom to their own factory or uh, giving Cardamom to uh, uh, you know, firms which are more interested in export. And the third is these small planters bringing Cardamom to shops and selling. So there are three uh, things. Uh, what helps the spot market, the auction uh, to, to kind of continue uh, despite it being slightly fragmented, the, the largest spot market being slightly fragmented uh, is the fact that uh, a whole, so because, because the spot, the auction can happens in, uh, you know, of different quality uh, cardamom or, you know, ungraded cardamom comes in the auction market, right? Which provides the space for all kind of actors in the in the market and in in the case of cardamom uh, domestic market has replaced international market as the as the major buyer in that sense uh, and the most cardamom that is demanded in the region, in the in the national market of india in the domestic market um, doesn't uh, need the kind of quality that is 8 mm uh, plus quality that the export market uh, need and because the export market quality is supreme, like high quality, and then that is is uh, is rather a small part of the pie, uh, the large pie still forms uh, in the in the in the auction market. And because you can, like I said, you can have a lot with thirty percent seven point five and twenty percent seven and twenty five percent six point five, so on and so forth. You can have all the permutation combination, uh, but you can grade them uh, into different quality, uh, and and you can. You can you can basically sell it in different markets uh, and make a lot of money. So that that flexibility uh, exists in the in the uh, uh, auction uh, market. Uh, so that is why, despite uh, the largest spot market being slightly fragmented, the the, the auction market uh, managed to hold on. Um, uh, there is definitely a case that if the scenario is inverted and if the international market becomes uh, the largest buyer. Um, we don't know what would happen to the auction market. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a counterfactual question, uh, you know, at this point. Um, so that is an interesting counterfactual question. And I think you are uh, definitely on dot, uh, in spotting the fact that there is definitely some fragmentation within the spot market itself. I hope that's clear. Thank you. Thanks. Tony. Thank yeah. I hope there will not be any questions or comments. Shall I wind up uh, Professor Pinoj then? Yes, I think so. If yeah. there are any more questions, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Tony Gurian, for the comprehensive analysis of the issue, and thank you for informing us this the trajectory of 
how cardamom is cardamom future become futureless and uh, thank you again <laughs> thank you thank you uh, thanks again and uh, thank you for this opportunity i really really appreciate uh, this platform thank you yeah.